Good morning, Good morning, everyone. You want to follow along this morning, we'll be in Colossians chapter 3. I, um, don't, I don't claim to be an expert on a lot of things, but in the last three months, I feel like there is one particular thing I've become an expert on. And I'm just going to share this with you just to help you a little bit. Um, just, just because, because I hear some of the rustling for the last couple of weeks, weeks, which is fine, but I'm just going to help you out. out. The best thing to do is to take that little cup, and as soon as you walk in and sit down, go ahead and start fooling and get that bread out and ready to, you know, kind of kind of loosen it up. Because it can be a little tricky. Um, and when you're when when Dan or whoever's up here and the time is on, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on you. I mean, you know, you, the time is your time is ticking. So uh, you. <laughs> So, so you, you might, might want to do, do that, that ahead of time, time. Uh, make, make it a little easier, easier on yourself. Um, <coughs> the, uh, I, you, you know, know when, when you, when, when you read scripture, scripture especially when you read scripture, scripture um, multiple, multiple times, times read, you, you know, know, some passages, passages you know, many, many of us, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, there are probably passages in the Bible we've either never read or read once or read very few times and completely forgot about them. There, there are other passages, passages that we may have read, read you know, any, 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 as, as many as 10, 10 15, 20, 50 times. And uh, there are, there are things, things that resonate with us and things that, are, um, that, that, that mean a lot to us. Maybe it's because, because of where we were when we read them at a certain time or just the message itself is something that, that, that resonates with us to a great degree. And the passage I want to share with you this morning is uh, in Colossians chapter 3. And it, in my you know, personal opinion, uh, this is about as um, concise yet specific um, outline for what the life of a Christian is supposed to look like. Um, this is something that really does talk about the, the, the things that, you know, the, the person that we are supposed to be, the things that we are supposed to avoid, and the things that we are supposed to embrace. And Paul does a, a tremendous job here of getting, again, very, very specific in kind of a brief enough way where you can handle it. I would say if you are struggling with anything at this time or, or at any time, just kind of make a note to yourself that Colossians chapter 3 is always a great place to go. To, to get re-centered on what it is that God would have us centered on. Paul makes an assumption when he addresses, uh, when he gets to this part of his letter, and the assumption is that the people that he is talking to are people that understand who Jesus is. So there's an assumption that we already know, that the audience in Colossae already knows, and I'm making the same assumption here today, that we already know that Jesus is the Son of God. And that we already know that Jesus is the Christ. We already know that Jesus is the Savior. And he is the, he is the only begotten Son of the one true and only God of the world. And we know that he makes an assumption because in verse 1 he says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, meaning if you are already a Christian, is, what that is, is, is the idea there, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You see, the Christian life is one of sacrifice. The human life outside of God is one of acquisition. It is one of self-centeredness. It is one of chasing your dreams. Get what you can. That is, that is what the world encourages, and that is what life outside of God is focused on. Make yourself happy. Do what you want. Have it your way. It's all about me. I am the sinner, or a little bit scarier phrase, but probably more true. I am the God of my own life. And Jehovah is either nowhere to be found, or he is somewhere that I place him off to the side in case of emergency break open glass like a fire extinguisher. And God, of course, desires and needs to be 
more than that. And he tells us how to do that. We start, again, once we have become Christians, once we have been raised up in Christ, as Paul says, we set our minds on things that are above. And this is not a light switch that you just turn on. All of a sudden, I've popped up out of the water, I've been baptized, my sins have been forgiven, and now I'm just going to set all my mind all the time on things above. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. It's not that simple. This is a process. This is a growth process. The more you understand who Jesus is, the more you understand about what Jesus is, um, you know, was as a man on this earth and who he is as the Savior of the world today, the more that desire to set your mind on him and not on this makes more sense. And the more you understand and see about God's grace and God's love and God's forgiveness and God's desire for you to be his child, the more you are able to set your mind on things above and be concerned with things about him because you see when it talks about us being died that means you know die to ourself take it you know, take up our cross different phrases we see throughout the new testament are the same idea the idea is is that my desires fade away and they are replaced in my life with god's desires And I think Paul does a masterful job here when he, how he phrases this. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's, it's, it's behind God. It's behind Christ. So when someone looks at you, they should see Christ, because your self is hidden behind him. He is out front, and we are hidden behind him. But the great part of that, about that is, is verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Amen. You see, when, when we align our lives with Christ and we hide behind him and make him the center, then when he is revealed to the world, we are revealed to the world. But you see, that's not what we're, what we're all about. Therefore, we don't necessarily worry about that. that is a, those are words of comfort, but that's not really our big concern. Our big concern is Jesus being out front. <clears throat> Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you once walked when you were living with them. Now, this should both be a warning and an encouragement. It is a warning to those that are in Christ. And it says, look, if you're going to turn to these things, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, that is essentially worshiping another god. When you see the word idolatry, that's what that means. It's the idea of making something an idol. And you see, that's what this whole thing comes down to. We talk a lot about a lot of different things, a lot of different issues, and all that is great. We need to do that. But at the end of the day, it's anything you put before God is an idol. Amen. The days of physical golden structures, for the most part, are really over. That's not, like, in our culture, that's not necessarily what we do. But what we do is we tie the word idol to that structure, not understanding that when our focus becomes anything other than God, that thing is an idol. And an idol can be something that is inherently good. Your family can be an idol. Your children can be an idol. Your parents can be an idol. Your spouse can be an idol. Those things are all inherently good. God tells us to love them. But he also tells us that Jesus... When the chips are down and we have to we have to choose one, you know, if we're put in a position by our family to choose them or choose God, we choose God. <clears throat> and again, many of these things are obvious, as Paul says in other places. He doesn't say that's here, but the idea of you know immorality and the idea of impurity, these are these are behaviors in our life. Immorality, you know, being being dishonest, taking advantage of people. 
Uh, impurity typically has a sexual connotation. The idea that you know that 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 you are having a, a, you're having a, you know, sexual relationships or some kind of sexual experiences outside of the construct of marriage. Passion. The idea that you're gonna you know that, that you're gonna chase after something no matter what it costs you. You know. Jesus himself says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And he doesn't even answer the question. The question is posed by Jesus in a rhetorical fashion because to ask that question is to answer it. The answer is obvious. It doesn't profit anybody anything to gain the whole world and lose their soul. Evil desires, greed. You know, we typically use greed in the idea of, of, of lusting after things, physical things. Because you see, we do. We have voids in our life. We have problems sometimes. And so what we try to do is we try to go find the things on this earth that fill the emotional voids that we have. And we do so by doing these things. By behaving a certain way. By seeking certain relationships. By chasing after ga gaining more things. And what always happens, we spend all that time and energy and effort to do those things. We get those things sometimes. We have those things. We have, you know, we did successfully take advantage of somebody and got more than we should have gotten. We successfully have a relationship that is impure and not of God. We successfully get more money or get more stuff or get the, you know, get the house, the car, the, you know, the clothes, whatever it may be that we want so bad. And what we find is once we have those things, they're not the answer. The void that we tried to fill is either still there or maybe even possibly it has grown. Because now, because now we know the thing that we thought was going to solve the problem doesn't. And now we're more desperate. So if we're not careful, we go back to this same well. Well, the greed didn't help me. How about the immorality? The immorality didn't help me. How about the evil desire? Well, the evil desire chasing that didn't help me. So how about the impurity? And we go back to this well. And we go back to this well. And what happens is we just dig ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper into, into being lost and despair and sin and helplessness. And the, and the warning to us about that is, this is what brings about the wrath of God. Now, the encouraging part is, though, if you are in these things, you can get out. That's the encouraging part. Because Paul says to them, and in them you once walked. He's saying, you, this used to be you. But now it's not. Verse 8, but now you also put, a, put them all aside, all those things we talked about, and anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. These things, these, these two lists, immorality, excuse me, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which all are idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech, lying to one another, these are all things that are easy to find. And these are all things that you, that you, that you are going to be a victim of. If you live in this world, people are going to lie to you. If you live in this world, people are going to be hateful towards you. If you live in this world, people are going to try to trick you. People are going to try to take advantage of you. And we love justice. We love it. I want to treat somebody the way they treat me. If they try to take advantage of me, I'm going to try to take advantage of them. If they're unkind to me, I'm going to be unkind to them. If they don't forgive me, I'm not going to forgive them. But that's not, 
what Paul is about to get into. Continuing verse 11, a renewal in which there is no talk about being renewed in the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. There's a lot of talk in this world right now about unity and inequality. And the fact of the matter is, in Jesus is the only place you're going to try and find true equality. Pushing the government for it is going to be a futile effort. They have always and will always fall short of God. Come to Christ. That is where true unity and true equality is found. Verse 12. So as those who have been chosen by God. Uh-oh, this is us now. This is us. This is the people he's talking to in Colossae. This is us. If, we, if this is where we are today, which, I'm, which I know most of you are, we have been chosen by God. We have accepted his gift. We have become Christians. We are trying to live the life of him. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. There is so much in this. There is so much in this. But you see, this is why in other places in the Bible, it is so evident that being a person of God, being a child of God, being what we would call today a Christian, is something that stands out. Because all these things that we looked at in the, in, the, in the first part of this passage are all things that we know exactly what they are. We know exactly what that looks like for two reasons. We have been on the receiving end of those things at different times in our life. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've probably doled out some of that stuff too. So we know what that looks like. And what Paul is saying here is when you put on Christ, this is what you're supposed to look like. You're supposed to have a heart of compassion. We feel for other people. Kindness. We treat other people well. Humility. <clears throat> and I know humility is right in the middle, but I would argue that the more that the more we can understand and practice humility in our lives, the easier these other things become. Because typically if we don't have compassion, it's because we think someone is either responsible for their, for their own difficulty or we believe that, you know, it's their fault, so they should stay in there. They, they, they deserve that, they earn that, so they should keep that hardship. The implication of that perspective is I don't have that hardship because I don't deserve that. And that is not what humility is. Humility is the understanding of what I get, I get. And I'm going to praise God through it. And it might not be easy and it might be hard. I might not like it. All that is okay. But I'm going to praise God through it. I'm not going to be angry at God because I don't deserve it. I'm going to be humble and honor God. The gentleness, the patience, the bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Boy, forgiveness is a big one. Jesus talked about it at the end of his at the end of his model prayer. Basically, he 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 correlated the amount of forgiveness that we receive from God with the amount of forgiveness we give other people. Based on the words of Jesus in that text, my advice to all of us would be forgive all the time. <laughs> forgive everything. As hard as it is, and it is so hard. It is so, it is so hard. When someone hurts you deeply, to forgive that is so hard. It's so hard. 
And with the way our brains work, we don't forget things. You know, the, the, old, the old phrase your grandmother maybe used to say is forgive and forget, right? Woo! I got my hands full with just forgiving. <laughs> Forgetting, you're putting a whole other mountain on there, right? Some things you can't forget. <clears throat> but we've got to forgive. We have to. Because if forgiveness, if we don't forgive, then you can't be humble. If someone sin, sins against you and you don't forgive them, then your perspective is you have the upper hand on them. They've not done to you what you've done to them. Or they've not, you've not done to them what they've done to you. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. So in our relationship, I have the upper hand. I am the superior one. Because I didn't do that thing, you did. So difficult. But yet, that's what godliness is. Because it all comes back to looking at Jesus. It all comes back to looking at Jesus. He says, all these things should manifest themselves into love, in verse 14. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. If we have a unity problem, we have a love problem. Period. If we have a unity problem, then we have a love problem. Sometimes we do things for the purpose of unity. And I think what Paul is saying here, he says in other places, as do other New Testament writers, unity is a byproduct of love. It's going to be hard for the unity to come first and the love to come later. We don't typically say, let's get married, we'll figure out the love part later. Right? That's, not, that's not usually what we do. When we're standing there in the delivery room and we see our child come into the world for the first time, we don't think, you know, that'll be a cute kid once they clean him up. I'll probably learn to love him after a year or three or four, and then we'll kind of go from there. It's not how that works. It's silly to even think about that, right? It is the love that brings forth the unity. And that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Be thankful to be in that body. We were called together. Let's be thankful about that. It's easy to pick out problems of the body. It's easy, and we're so tempted to do it so often because the body is full of imperfect parts. We're full of imperfect parts. 100% of our body is imperfect <clears throat> when it comes to being separate from Jesus. When I say imperfect, I'm talking about on our own, we are flawed. <clears throat> but we should be thankful because we can be unified, we can be perfect, we can be the body of Christ through him. Verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God whatever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father how many of how many of your of your friends or relationships that you have how many people do you sing to Other than Troy, probably not very many. Troy likes to sing to people. My grandfather used to call me on my birthday and sing happy birthday to me every morning. Or every August 31st morning, not every single day. You, you know what I meant. Most people didn't do that. We sing to people that we love. It's... it's it's an outpouring of joy. Singing is an outpouring of joy. And we communicate to each other and to God through song because we should be joyful here. We should be full of love for God and each other. 
So that's what we do. That's how we teach you. That's one of the ways that we teach and admonish each other is through songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then as we just read, I'm going to finish up as Paul finishes up this section of Scripture right here. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. <clears throat> speaking of, speaking of, of pop-up, he used to say, long before it was, a, it was a wristband or a t-shirt, he used to say, you should ask yourself, what would Jesus do before you do something? And if Jesus would do it, then, you know, that's probably a good thing to do. If Jesus wouldn't do it, probably not a good thing to do, right? I mean, that's essentially what, 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 we're say, what, what, what Paul is saying here. He's saying, whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. And if you don't think Jesus would sign off on that based on his scripture, then don't do it. If you do think Jesus would sign off on that based on, based on the scripture and what is taught, then you should do that. And that really is as cliche as it has become. And unfortunately, it, it has become cliche. And it's a shame because it's such good advice. It really is good advice. And when things become cliche, oftentimes we just kind of let them fall by the wayside. And that's unfortunate. Because it is good to ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Jesus was, stood in the face of persecution. How did he respond? He, he was the object of hate. How did he respond? He was the object of mockery. How did he respond? He was the object of violence. How did he respond? He was the object of all of these things that are bad in this passage. People treated Jesus with anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech. He was the object of other people's immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. And what did he do? What did he do? He responded with a heart of compassion, Amen. kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. He bared with other people or bore with other people he forgave other people and he put on love he did exactly what Paul is talking about here that's exactly what we need to do